Coming up on DTNS, a vulnerability in the trusted platform module. Spotify trials a cheaper plan. And Seth Rosenblatt is here to talk about the effects on security of right to repair. DTNS starts now. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Editor-in-Chief and founder of The Parallax, Seth Rosenblatt, is with us again. Welcome back, Seth. Hello. How's everyone doing? We're doing lovely. Thank you for asking. Uh, we were we were just talking about pneumatic tubes and a hack yes. on pneumatic yes. tubes with Seth. Uh, we were also talking about big box electronic stores we miss. All of that is on Good Day Internet. Get that by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Like our top-level patrons like Paul Boyer, Brad, and Kevin. Thank you for supporting the show. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Realme officially launched Magdart, an Apple MagSafe-esque system for the iPhone 12 range of phones. The company says that the 50-watt Magdart charger will fill a 4,500 milliamp hour phone battery up to 100% in 54 minutes and is also working on a 15-watt Magdart charger that will charge a 4,500 milliamp hour battery in 90 minutes. YouTube's $100 million fund to pay creators using its shorts format, which rolled out to 100 countries last month, is now live. You can get that money. YouTube says it'll invite thousands of eligible creators waiting to be won uh, or to be paid from the program through 2022. It's offering $100 to $10,000, depending on your engagement metrics. Anyone posting shorts is eligible for payment, though creators who participate in the YouTube partner program are exempt because you're already getting paid other ways. Apple has made the Magic Keyboard with Touch ID available for purchase separately for $149 or $179 if you want that number pad as well. Previously, the keyboard was only available with the purchase of a 24-inch iMac. And in potential future Apple product news, the Eurasian Economic Commission database has six new Apple Watch identifiers. Not too surprising, as an Apple Watch Series 7 is expected in this fall. There were also two new Mac identifier, uh, identifiers added, which are likely new MacBook Pros with Apple's M-Series chips. After being named in a lawsuit filed by the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, the DFEH, alleging sexual discrimination and harassment, Blizzard Studio President J. Allen Brack has stepped down from the company and will be replaced by executive development VP Jen O'Neill and GM Mike Ibarra as co-leaders. In a statement, Blizzard indicated a desire to change its company culture. Twitter announced a partnership with the Associated Press and Reuters to add contacts to trending topics, starting with English language topics. This will be in addition to Twitter's crowdsourced fact-checking system Birdwatch already in place. Twitter also introduced support for account creation and login using Google or Apple accounts. Google login works on Android, iOS, and the web, and Apple login works on iOS with web support coming soon. So uh, it's uh, Black Hat Week, uh, which means you can expect your feeds to be filled with set your hair on fire, scary security stories. Uh, and uh, we will try to help you sort out the truly scary ones uh, from the other ones. This one isn't great, but at least it got caught by researchers. Security researchers at Dulles Group published the results of a pen test of a client's network penetration test in which they compromised the trusted platform module, the TPM chip. Researchers were given a Lenovo laptop with full disk encryption using Microsoft's BitLocker, a TPM of course, Eufy Secure Boot, password protected BIOS, and other recommended security implementations based on NIST standards. The encryption key for unlocking the drive was stored in the TPM. This is the default configuration. Now, Microsoft does advise using a pin or password to unlock the drive instead of letting the TPM just do it but only if the user believes they're at risk of someone gaining physical access to their machine with enough time to open it and solder a little bit inside. However, the Dulles Group researchers figured out a way to get the decryption key out of the TPM in 30 minutes without needing to use a soldering iron. The TPM communicates with the CPU using a serial peripheral interface, or SPI, and the SPI itself doesn't offer any encryption, so the TPM has to rely on the device it's communicating with to encrypt the connection. And it was communicating in this case with Microsoft's BitLocker, which does not use 
any of the latest TPM encryption standards. So there's a possibility of eavesdropping. To eavesdrop on the SPI communication, though, they had to attach leads to pins. They didn't have to solder. They just had to attach leads to pins. But those pins on the SPI are 0.25 millimeters wide and spaced a half millimeter apart. So not really possible without soldering. But the SPI chips shared a bus with the CMOS chip, which had larger pins. So the bus handled the communication for both the CMOS chip and the SPI chip. Any information coming from the TPM to the SPI chip came through that shared bus. So they attached their leads to the big pins of the CMOS bus. They used a Soleil logic analyzer to sniff the bytes moving through the shared bus. They used BitLocker SPI toolkit written by Henry Numi to isolate the decryption key. And Bob's your uncle, they could decrypt the hard drive. From there, it was a phishing expedition on the drive. That led to them finding a way into the company's VPN. Multiple security researchers offering ideas for mitigations here. It's a sophisticated attack, Seth. So I don't think most people in the world have to worry too much about it. But how much should we be concerned? Uh, it's the kind of attack that uh, the, the average consumer, uh, even us on this call, uh, probably don't have to worry about at all. Um, I would even venture to say that activists or journalists reporting on uh, sensitive topics probably don't have to worry about it unless uh, their organization, ha excuse me, unless their organization is sending them a brand new laptop that has uh, the latest and greatest uh, built in. Um, it is, however, uh, a concern, I think, for, for uh, employees of organizations that are engaging in uh, very sensitive uh, uh, data transfer. Um, if you are, say, you know, an engineer at a company that's got some very uh, protected uh, IP, uh, this might be something you'd have to worry about then. But it's, it, 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 it's, it's a very interesting hack, uh, yeah, the way yeah. that they got around this. It's it's a uh, it's vulnerable to like the housekeeper attack if you leave your laptop in the hotel right. room, right? right? Or or at the border if they take your laptop away for more than thirty minutes, you know, yes. potentially. Yes. Uh, but but yeah, it's it's. I think you're right. I'm I'm with you. It's more of interest how they were able to do it, uh, and and also I think good news in that it's like, hey, Microsoft, a you might want to support those TPM standards, uh, right? And and uh, also B, uh, even if you don't think someone has time to solder, uh, if you want to mitigate this, maybe turn on that password protection uh, for the decryption, right? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, on yesterday's show, we told you about YouTube's new, cheaper, ad-free tier that doesn't include YouTube music. But what if you really like music but also would like to not have ads? Ah, Spotify might have a solution for you. It has a new, cheaper, paid tier. It's not free, but it's a cheaper tier with ads called Spotify Plus with at least one user saying that they saw it offered for $0.99 cents per month. It's in testing, so not everybody may get the same price. Currently, for $99 per month, the premium tier gives you all the bells and whistles of Spotify. Apple Music, same price. But Spotify limits you to six song skips per hour and only lets you shuffle albums and playlists when you're on the free tier, the absolutely free tier. So this is something that's, you know, it's a buck a month, right, or thereabouts, but it might give you what you're looking for. Spotify Plus will still have ads, but it will let you skip as many songs as you want and select specific songs on an album or playlist to also listen to. Spotify is testing different price points with select listeners, but that 99 cent per month uh, seems to be one of the ways that they're testing things out. I, so $9.99 a month seems decent. That's that's the premium price, but I get why some people wouldn't want to pay it. They're like, you know what? I, I don't need that much expense. I also see that Spotify is like, yeah, but if we can, you know, boil the frog, get you to pay 99 cents a month just to skip after a while, maybe you'll be like, oh, gosh, not skipping. Being able to skip is nice, but I really would like to create my own playlists or, or all, you know, the other features that are in premium. Maybe the fact that they got you to pay a little gets you to pay a little more later. Right. Yeah. Mm. I actually, I, I'm lucky enough to, so I, I'm not a Spotify customer. I am an Apple Music customer, and and the, the two services, at least for that $10 premium tier, are more or less the same. I get it with my Verizon uh, mobile uh, subscription. It's just something that's, that's, that's bundled in. So it's not actually $10 that I pay for every month. I feel like I still would, uh, but... 
But if for some reason Verizon was like, eh, no longer offered, I might think about some of these things. You know, how often am I really skipping between songs more than six times per hour? Not often. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah. I, I mean, if there's like a new album that I'm interested in, I might be, I might be listening to some music. And there are other months that my activity is pretty low. So yeah, I think I think it it makes a lot of sense for Spotify to say, will you give us just a dollar a month, maybe 10 is a little bit too much for what you're looking to do, but uh, we, we can at least strip out those ads because that is, you know, well, that doesn't ideal. strip out the ads. The 99 cents leaves ads in, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So but, you're going to put up with that to... still. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, and then maybe there's, I don't know, a $5 tier at some point where they figured out something even, even more, you know, Right. Like how many tiers are they going to still don't want to pay the 10. Yeah. Every, every price point for every feature. I don't know, Seth, I don't even know what kind of music uh, service you, you pay attention to. Does this interest you at all? I, I pay for Spotify. Um, I've gone back and forth on quitting and uh, going to pay YouTube premium and my my i mean i've got like i don't know 12,000 15,000 songs or something um uh you know that i've liked on spotify so when they finally you know bumped us up that was a big deal um i, I it really bothers me that they still don't have a lot of the music that i want um, mm -hmm. um you know or they'll have you know every album by a by a specific artist except for one or two um so when they they try to nickel and dime uh uh you know uh free users into uh paying for just a slightly larger subscription than free but not the full ten dollars i don't i don't know i is it gonna i don't know that it's gonna work for them i don't know that people care enough mm. um i think it's frustrating for people who you know, may not be able to afford uh, a, a full time, you know, a full uh, $10 a month service or multiple services. Um, and ultimately, I think it's going to wind up driving people away. There's just there's yeah. too many different services. There's, uh, you know, too many different uh, ways of, of slicing and dicing it. But yeah, I'm, I'm also very skeptical about these things <laughs> to begin well, with. So. I, I think they end up people who want to use Spotify will continue to use the free whether they'll pay a little bit just to skip songs. I mean, that's why Spotify is testing it. Yeah. Right? They're, yeah. They're trying to figure it out. Yeah. 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 China's crackdown on tech platforms continues. Here's the latest. China's Economic Information Daily published an article condemning online game addiction, specifically mentioning Tencent's Honor of Kings, one of the most popular games in China. Hours later, Tencent, which makes Honor of Kings, announced that children younger than 12 may not spend money in the game. And... They took the time restriction for those children from a, one and a half hours per day down to an hour. After they did that, the article disappeared. The State Administration for Market Regulation said it would investigate mainland China's automotive chip makers for evidence of hoarding, price gouging, and collusion. China's car sales fell 5.1% in June, ending an 11-month streak of growth that may have pro prompted this investigation. And I'm going to take a deep breath here. The Central Propaganda Department of the Communist Party, the Ministry of Culture and Tourism, the State Administration of Radio and Television, the China Federation of Literary and Art Circles, and the Chinese Writers Association issued joint policy guidelines to encourage better culture and art reviews by, in part, limiting the role of algorithms in content distribution. The policy advises Chinese content creators to, quote, strengthen Marxist literary theory and criticism, and, quote, not to contribute to the spread of low, vulgar, and pandering content or quasi-entertainment content. Too much celebrity gossip. Not enough Marxist literary theory, basically, is what they're saying. The ongoing <laughs> crackdown has impacted companies in different ways. Tencent ended the day with its stock price down 6.1%. Gaming and online community company NetEase fell 7.8%. Video sharing site Billy Billy fell 3.4%. Ant Group Financial announced profits dropped 37% from the previous quarter following its canceled IPO. Meanwhile, Alibaba has been weathering things a little better. Revenue missing expectations, but still up 34% on the year, and earnings per share beating expectations. Cloud and commerce slowed, but global active consumers for Alibaba rose 45 million on the quarter. The bright spot for Alibaba was its worldwide expansion. 
Seth, I don't know if you've, you've been following the the ongoing China crackdown as it moves from food delivery to financial to chip makers, et cetera. Uh, but the, the, this is a, a march that China is making. And last Friday, we, we sort of talked about the fact that what they really want to do is get people to move off platforms talking about social media stuff and, mm -hmm. and start doing serious technology. And I, I found that reflected here. And they're saying, we don't want you gossiping about celebrities anymore. Right. <laughs> Yeah, the the I, I haven't fall, been following the latest in this uh, very closely, but certainly China has the ability to influence uh, how its people interact with technology and the internet uh, more so than almost any other uh, country on earth. Certainly more so than any other um, uh, widely active on the internet or widely engaged with technology uh, country. Um, it's 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 always fascinating from one perspective to watch what they do and what they're interested in. Um, uh, it's also kind of scary. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you and, know. and I, I think one of the things that I'm noting is they've gone from we'll let you be open up to a point right. to uh, that point is now narrower. And yeah, I'm not sure what sure. effect that's going to have on the economic benefits they got from allowing up to a point in the past. It's it's hard to 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 see that you know uh, separate from what's going on in Hong Kong. Um, they've you know been slowly tightening the vice on Hong Kong since '97, but just the most recent moves there yeah. uh, plus this all feel uh, connected uh, in a way. Um, the, the connections may be looser than than uh, tighter, but it just it it you know it's very interesting there. Well, folks, we love patrons that stick with us. Uh, the patrons are the majority focus uh, of, of who we serve and what we do and how we're funded. And that's why we're happy to offer Patreon loyalty rewards. Uh, you can get a unique sticker, mug, T-shirt, or hoodie every three months, as long as you stay a patron at the top four levels. Each one has unique art from Len Peralta featuring the DTNS seven-year anniversary logo. Go check them out. Look at the tier descriptions at patreon.com slash DTNS. Right to Repair is getting lots of momentum, even from U.S. federal government, but there are some security implications that go along with it. We talked about this, you know, a fair amount here on the show. So would finding a zero-day vulnerability count as repair, for example? Seth, what are your <laughs> thoughts? Uh, the right to repair movement is is super interesting because it's, you know, the uh, sort of a classic David versus Goliath, um, and the organizations, the the corporate organizations that have lined up against uh, the Davids in this, uh, you know, are as big as Apple. Um, they're uh, organizations that build, uh, you know, medical devices such as uh, CT scanners, um, and. Uh, the idea that you can't have that you can't have a third party come in and fix something, even after they've been trained, is is uh, I think sort of anathema to how we've developed technology, certainly in the U.S. Um, and then you add on to that the idea that uh, as part of the repair that they can't fix a security vulnerability in the device um, uh, when they have the opportunity to do so. Uh, is, is is just sort of a remarkable uh, uh, step backwards, I think. Um, there's, uh, you know, one of the, if you remember the the uh, Mirai botnet from a few years ago that infected all these video cameras around the world, um, one of the solutions proposed, and I think implemented in, to some degree, was uh, to force out a firmware update that would patch the vulnerability and close the security hole that allowed the botnet to access that camera. Um, uh, does that fall under right to repair? Uh, you know, it's certainly not something that the vendors of those cameras the, and the manufacturers of those cameras uh, had a hand in because they were these very small manufacturers from who knows where, uh, you know, and, and otherwise did not include uh, over the air updates. Um, so I, I personally think that, that you know, given the the, uh, risks that security vulnerabilities can face, you know, being able to do so to, to fix them is hugely important. Um, and we're starting to see, you know, California, Colorado, of course, uh, Massachusetts uh, are all uh, working on or have passed recently uh, right to repair bills. Massachusetts is, 
is working its way through the courts. I know Pennsylvania is considering one. Um, Hawaii is considering one. These, I think this is going to be become a, a, a nationwide thing very shortly. Yeah, I, I think this is an interesting take because we've talked before at length on the show about uh, the idea that you should have the right to fix something because, you know, if it's broken, uh, it's a lot cheaper to fix it yourself uh, than mm -hmm. to pay someone else to fix it or to replace it. A lot of times companies don't even repair your thing. They just they just want to swap it out, which is wasteful. But there's this other aspect of it, which is, yes, companies generally work with security researchers. Uh, there are stories of security researchers getting in trouble for mm -hmm. fixing a vulnerability, which is it has a chilling effect. Even if it doesn't happen all that often, it happens sure. enough that some security researchers are like, yeah, I'm not gonna mess with that. So if you have right to repair, cover security vulnerabilities, you're going right. to encourage more people to look for vulnerabilities, which means you'll find more vulnerabilities, which means you'll patch more vulnerabilities, right. which I think is good for all of us, right? Right. And, you know, one, one thing I just want to quickly interject that uh, uh, is, is also really important, especially on medical devices. I, I wrote about this uh, in May just before I went on paternity leave, uh, which is that um, a lot of devices, a lot of medical devices uh, are uh, under contract and cannot be cannot legally be repaired even by a licensed third party technician, even a third party technician who has training, who knows what they're doing, uh, legally cannot come in and fix things, uh, stuff like motorized wheelchairs. And there are uh, numerous cases where people who depend on these devices uh, for their lives um, have not been able to use them once they break down because there is, you know, there's two technicians for serving the entire US and we're in the middle of a, you know, of a pandemic lockdown. Yeah. And so they, they can't get on a plane. Um, they also may have a backlog of, you know, 500 cases or whatever the issue is. Uh, it's it's really sort of shocking to see manufacturers, um, uh, s s you know, spiting their own noses, you know, despite their face. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's really unfortunate uh, because they could be doing their their customers a service by encouraging this, um, or at least Please. setting up setting up sane regulations and and guide rails on how they want things done. Um, but to just you know st stamp down on it uh, is is stomp down on it is yeah, yeah. really not really not so. Stop eating your own nose. For goodness Damn sake, it. ridiculous. Yep. All right. Uh, in July, we talked about how vulnerabilities in software from a company called Kaseya let ransomware group R Evil crack into 50 managed service providers, which in turn led to ransomware attacks on around 1,500 client organizations of those MSPs. Reuters' Joseph Men has a story out now noting that several security researchers say that attackers are now targeting MSPs because, uh, man, they saw how effective our evil's attack was, and that looks real attractive <laughs> to them. Head sure. of the nonprofit Dutch Institute for Vulnerability Disclosure, Victor Gevers, said they have discovered vulnerabilities in more MSPs and are working with them to fix it. And Bug Crowd, Chief Executive Ashish Gupta, says their vulnerability reporting platform has seen flaws as bad as Kaseya's being reported. Yeah. The U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, offers free risk assessments, penetration testing, and an analyses of network architecture. But Seth, basically the, the, the message of this report uh, is they're coming. They're coming for you. Sure. I mean, and we saw this with solar winds last, uh, you know, last, last uh, winter. Um, it, MSPs offer a really attractive target. Why spend all this energy and effort targeting one uh, company, even if it's a high profile company like Apple, when you can get 50 smaller companies and get much more bang for your buck out of the same vulnerability? Uh, it's, it's, it's economics. Um, and that's something that we that we really see a lot of these days in uh, you know in the cyber criminal space, which is they're looking at economic incentive. They're looking where they can make money, um, whether it's you know espionage or ransomware or or whatever. Uh, at the end of the day, it's what kind of value can they get for their efforts. Um, so the fact that you know MSPs are are really high up on the target list now should should be a surprise to nobody.
Yeah. It, uh, yeah. There was there was an interview kicking around uh, today uh, that uh, was with a group saying we're we're only targeting uh, companies that that are a hundred million dollars or more. Yeah. Uh, right. Which which sure. it, it, they're <laughs> they're trying to make it sound like they're they're doing the world a favor by only get, going after the fat right. cats. But of course that's the companies where you can get more money out of them. Right. 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 And I mean that reminds me of last year when. One of these ransomware gangs uh, announced that they would, because of the pandemic, they were putting a pause on targeting uh, healthcare and hospitals. Uh, yeah, so that didn't actually happen. They did not pause on targeting healthcare or hospitals. They had some of the highest profile uh, attacks against uh, hospitals last uh, in in the fall of last year. Um, I, I don't know that you can actually believe anything that uh, sure. a cyber criminal gang is going to tell you because they have their own agenda, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. There is honor amongst thieves, but not honor between thieves and the person they're robbing, usually. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just. Just be cool, Robert. Come on. You know, we've got honor. Uh, well, whether or not you're in a hospital, uh, you probably care about washing your hands. And Amazon has a new smart soap dispenser that works with its voice assistant. So you tell the assistant and it helps you do what you want. The $55 gadget includes a set of 10 LED lights that count down as you're washing your hands for the 20 seconds that's currently recommended by the CDC. You can optionally pair the smart soap dispenser with a compatible Echo device to access a supporting routine that would, say play your favorite song or tell you a joke or a fun fact or otherwise fill up those 20 seconds while you're washing your hands. Oh the smart God. soap dispenser comes with a 802.11n Wi-Fi, uh, I, which is, you know, okay. And a micro USB port also, okay, uh, for charging. But it has those things. Well, I don't understand what this does. It's a series of LEDs that blink at you. Counting down the 20 seconds you're supposed to be washing your hands and yeah, it's, a, it's a progress and plays, bar. You, and plays you music. And it can also play well, you music. It plays so you music if you have it paired to an echo device. It yeah. actually and doesn't it, even have a like a, a speaker a, inside it's of itself. It's a $55 internet connected progress bar. Basically, yes. Jeez. So, okay, Seth, I'm really <laughs> glad that I, I'm glad that you said that's not me because earlier, you know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. And I was like, no, it isn't. I mean, listen, it's, it's, it's important. It, we should all be right? washing our hands for 20 yeah. seconds. Like, I'm not going to yeah. argue with you about that, but it for does sure. seem like overkill for something that is, you know, kind of all the rage. I, I remember you. Everyone's ignoring the major function of this, which is it just dispenses when it, it, it senses your hand. And dispenses. You don't have to push down on it. It's touchless. Right. I could get a touchless soap well, dispenser for okay. much cheaper. To me, that's the yeah. compelling feature. Yeah. You necessarily need the LED lights and the Wi-Fi. I mean, I remember years ago uh, reading a, a, an article about how um, the biggest cause of bacterial infection in uh, operating rooms was that doctors weren't washing their not just doctors, nurses, everyone in there wasn't wa weren't washing their hands um, before. Uh, you know, before before uh, uh, starting surgery, they were literally not scrubbing in, uh, which we all know that they should do. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. Like, I think what they wound up doing was just creating better messaging for washing their hands and not creating a freaking fifty-five dollar <laughs> internet connected sort of progress bar. It's crazy. You're, you, you go to someone else's house, it's a dinner party, and you go in their bathroom and you're like, well, that's fancy. Right. You know, it's, <laughs> like a, it's, right. like a, it's a fun gift maybe to give somebody. It's, it, okay. this is, all right. It's, it's not that it doesn't, you know, it serves some sort of a purpose. What do you get like, for the person who has everything but also has dirty hands? There sure. you go. It, it's like, do, do you guys remember from a few years ago at, at, at CES, yeah, the, the, the internet connected fork? Right. You remember this? Yes, and yes, it would like course. it would like monitor your meals for you yeah. it would, it would or something. Gauge yeah. how much you ate based on yeah. something. Yeah. This is like yeah. this, but for soap. <laughs> I mean, we're still on that kick. We're trying to monitor just about everything that I, I don't need. To do. I, here's and the way I look at it, over. honestly. I don't need my soap dispenser to be hackable. Motion right. sensing, great. Wi Fi, no, I don't I, I yeah. don't think I, yeah. 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 Uh, All right, let's check out the mailbag. 
All right, let's do it. This one comes in from Thor. This is in response to Chris Christensen's tip yesterday about the Cable Car Museum in San Francisco. Thor says, I love technical museums, and I'd like to share another that I visited while interrailing around Europe. The Nikola Tesla Museum in Belgrade, Serbia. Loads of cool steampunky stuff, and of course, a big Tesla coil. Wishing you all great travels. Oh, that's very cool. Um, if yeah. I ever get to Belgrade... I will go there. That that looks great. I'm glad they uh, that he reminded us. I I think maybe I'd heard of this before, but very I think, cool. I feel like too. Yeah, I've I've, I've never been there. Um, and uh, <laughs> if we all should be so lucky to travel soon, um, <laughs> let's go. If, let's go when to, Serbia go to, will let us in. Oh, that's we'll right. Check it out. Yeah. Let's all go to the Tesla Museum. Uh, if you have feedback on anything that we talk about on the show, we would love to hear it. Uh, really, really enjoy questions, comments, all the feedback that you've got for us every day. Keep it coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Also, special thanks to Mark Allen L Leonisio, who's our uh, one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Mark, you've been a supporter for many years. We thank you wholeheartedly. Thank you. Also, Indeed. thanks to... Seth Rosenblatt for being with us today. A lot of security news to talk about, Seth. Um, where it's going to get worse. <laughs> I know. Well, just with Black Hat and DEF CON coming, even though they're they're mostly virtual with some people in person, this week is going to be really busy. So if you start seeing a whole bunch of scary headlines, just take a deep breath, drink some water, maybe some whiskey, and then dive in. Whatever you do. Well, and, and yeah. Where, where can people keep up with uh, uh, your work that might be, you know, debunking uh, some things that might be too scary for other folks? Sure. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Seth R. That's S-E-T-H-R. And uh, the Parallax View newsletter, which focuses on cybersecurity and healthcare, is at the-parallax.com. That's it. All good. Well, thanks. This, so this is the applause today. for Mark Allen Leonesio that I, I couldn't get to play earlier. So, oh. yeah, I, just I mean, sure I, I don't mind being applauded. That's you fun. can have some applause too. Yeah, yeah, I feel like Seth deserves applause. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this goes right. This goes right. <laughs> Folks, we're live on this show Monday through Friday. We do it every weekday, 4 30 p.m. Eastern, 20 30 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we will be back here doing it again tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>